and I've been told I have to project without a microphone. So if I'm not projecting, <laughs> please let me know. Quiet librarians, you know, here. Little do they know. Welcome to Drake and uh, Live at Cole's Library. Um, I want to thank you all for, for being here this evening. A um, couple of people I have to thank uh, for making sure this event took place this evening. Uh, Susan Breckenridge of Cole's Library staff. Right here. Thank you. For Beth Cutterbeck from uh, Advancement. Beth is not here. Okay. Um, on February the first, I had uh, an encounter with a truck crossing the street out here on University mm -hmm. Avenue. Is that truck no, I won. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, little worse for wear, but uh, actually, this evening is the first evening I've been able to walk with the king. Or so. are you in the crossroads? Yes, I was. I had the green. But uh, there's somebody else I want to thank because she's been very supportive over the last couple of months, and that's my wife, Becky. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple other quick uh, announcements. Uh, currently in our Collier Heritage Room, uh, we have a photographic exhibit of uh, Verona Calhoun Johnston, who, as you know, uh, was Drake's oldest living graduate. She lived to be 114 years old. And uh, in March of 2002, our speaker this evening, Nina Ellis, wrote, quote, if I live to be 100 in Lessons from the Centurions, she had an opportunity to meet and interview uh, Veronica Johnson. In the afterword of uh, Mrs. Ms. Ellis' book, she described Johnson as being alert and spunky. She was 110 at that time. So I hope we all make it that, that long. Nina Ellis's book was also the impetus behind uh, our other new exhibit, uh, which is entitled, What a Time We Had, Women Remember Drake. This project is based on oral history interviews that we conducted with nearly two dozen Drake alum uh, who attended the university over the last seven decades. We're also about to bring up an interactive website uh, which will have a large part of the interviews that we conducted <coughs> in digital files. So we invite you to visit the physical display in the college, Collier Heritage Gallery, and to look forward to our digital archive, which will be available shortly. And I need to introduce then uh, Professor Kathleen Richardson, who's going to do the introductions this evening. on behalf of the Drake School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Nina is a 1977 graduate of the Journalism School in Radio Television. And while at Drake, she was chairwoman of an organization called the National International Awareness Committee. She wrote for the Times Delphic newspaper, and she worked at WHO Radio while she was at Drake. Nina began her broadcast career as a teenager working at her parents' radio station in Valparaiso, Indiana. Since her days in Indiana and in Iowa, she has become an award-winning journalist and author. She's been a writer and producer for, among other programs, National Public Radio's Weekend Edition and All Things Considered news programs. She has also worked on documentary films for the National Park Service and the Discovery Channel. And she's conducted <coughs> oral histories for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Her work has won many awards for broadcast excellence, including three George Foster Peabody Awards, the Radio Television News Director's Edward R. Murrow Award, and the Alfred DuPont Columbia University Award. She turned a series of NPR interviews with 100-year-old Americans into a best-selling book, If I Live to Be 100, Lessons from the Centenarians. Most recently, she traveled across the country 
for a public radio series documenting America's dwindling one-room schools and the communities they serve. Please join me in welcoming Nina Ellis. Oyster. 
and I traveled a lot, and um, I, I do want to show you, however. <coughs> this is a photograph of me about a year after I graduated in my parents' radio station. This was my, we didn't even have electric typewriters. I mean, the rest of the world had electric typewriters, but in Indiana, we had this, this was my typewriter, this was my reel-to-reel -reel tape, this was the radio scanner here. This was a device called a cart machine, which played like eight tracks, which is where we play the video. This is what the radio is. Um, what you can't see up here is what the headline really said it was local, go local news girl makes it in nation's capital. <laughs> <laughs> the hair. The hair, you know, the hair is a constant problem, so thank you for not watching. <laughs> um, I went to Washington and I had a I worked on daily news programs. In the 90s, I left all things considered to become a freelancer. Um, a lot of reasons, but one reason was that it was very difficult in those days to cross over from being on the production side to being a reporter. And I felt like I had to leave there in order to be a reporter. So I did, and I uh, promptly went back to work for NPR as a freelancer and did a lot of work as a reporter, freelance reporter and freelance producer, uh, doing much longer form stories than uh, I was able to do in the daily news. Um, this is, uh, I, was, I was in Tokyo here doing stories about the Japanese rush to build the supercomputer. Um, this is a story I went to do in Mozambique um, during the Civil War there. Can we turn off the lights so we can see? Well, maybe so. Uh, oh, much better. Uh, this is in a village in the northwestern part of Mozambique where we were doing stories about refugee children who had been separated from their parents during the Civil War. We found one little boy and we were traveling with him trying to find his parents, which never happened, I'm sorry to say. But. Yeah. I was uh, hmm, 92, somewhere. Um, shortly after the Soviet Union collapsed, I went there and did a number of stories. Um, one about the prospects for uh, collective farming in Russia after the collapse. Uh, basically, the short stories, the prospects were not good. And uh, I also did a really interesting profile of a very eminent biologist in Russia named Nikolai Vovilov, who, uh, was, uh, whose name is barely known in the rest of the world, but who was a scientist you know, uh, who proved Darwin's theory of evolution in the plant world and basically was put to death for uh, denying that it was only the central government that could improve crop quotas. It was a fascinating time to be there, as you can imagine. In the mid-90s, uh, for a lot of complicated reasons, I felt like I had to go to, uh, much to my mother's dismay, um, I felt like I had to go to Sarajevo during the Civil War there. And luckily, uh, through contacts at NPR, because I had a good friend who was NPR's correspondent in Sarajevo, and he made contacts for me and, made it possible for me to go there. While I was there, I taught radio production to high school kids and did a couple of documentaries um, about daily life in Sarajevo. I was not enough of an expert to be able to try to do stories about the political standoff there. Um, but I was able to get around the city and do stories about how people were able to get along during the Civil War. Uh, and the short story of that is not very well. Um, I came back from that, though, and um, sort of ready to not travel quite so much. It was a very harrowing time. Um, this photograph was taken uh, a few days after I came out. My father came to get me. And uh, uh, anyway, it was, it, when I came back, I said, you know, I think I'm going to stay home for a while. And I did, and I worked on um, some arts programming. I wrote a series of about jazz history with Winton Marsalis, which was a great experience. 
I did some programming about popular music and popular culture for NPR. And then at the end of 1999, I sort of got the idea that I wanted to do a series about the 20th century because I've always been interested in history. I always find myself gravitating toward the oldest person in the room, no matter where I am. And uh, I had interviewed a lot of World War II combat veterans, been to Bosnia, and I had also been working for a number of years on a very expensive oral history program at the Holocaust Museum, which Kathy mentioned. So I felt like I had a lot of the, I was prepared to do kind of a long-term historical project. And that's what I proposed, that I would go around the country, interview people who were 100 years old, and have them tell stories about their memories. Well, I interviewed, I don't know, four or five people. And in De December of 1999, I very, in, in a totally accidental sequence of events, I interviewed three people. One of them was a hundred one-year-old law professor. One of them was a 101-year-old woman who was an eminent researcher in dyslexia and was keeping up with all kinds of brain research. And the third one was a woman who lived alone on a lake in a little house and rode her boat every day for an hour. And I thought, something's going on here that I didn't really plan on. And that was that so I went back and did some more research, and I found out that there were, at that time and still, at least 50,000 people in the United States who were 100 years old. And of those 50,000 people, one third of them had never had a major illness. And I thought this was incredibly, I had never heard that. I, you know, I, and yet, everyone I talked to, seem to know somebody who was 100 years old, or nearly 100 years old, or had some fantastic story about someone who was 98 and still tilling the garden every year. You know, so these anecdotally, it all made sense to me. But it wasn't until I went back and uh, found people at the New England Centenarian Study at Harvard, and I called them up and I said, you know, am I right? There's something going on. Oh, they said, oh, there, 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 there really is something going on. So I went back to my editor and I said, look, you know, remember that history? Go and I then decided that I would talk to these people about what it was like to be 100 years old in the present tense. I did ask them a lot of questions about history because I'm very interested in how they survived, and, um, but many of them didn't want to talk about the past, which was incredibly uplifting and kind of fascinating to me. Um, I want to read you a little bit from the book. And, uh, one of the people that I mentioned to you, um, this lady, uh, her name is Anna Wilmot. When I met her, she was 101, and she's the lady who was rowing her boat every morning. Uh, she lived on, on a lake just west of Springfield, Massachusetts, in a little town called Westfield, where she had been spending, she'd spent every summer there all her life and lived in this same house since the 30s. Um, she, everybody knew her, she was perfectly happy living by herself. She was busy, she was driving a car, she was visiting quote unquote old people in the nursing home. <laughs> she was a firefighter. And uh, I just really kind of fell in love with her. Um, and she <coughs> was mystified as to why I would want to talk to her. Um, however, when I finally convinced her that you know, people would like to hear about what it was like to be 100 years old, and she said, OK, OK. And she brought me into her living room, which looked like something out of the Smithsonian, and, uh, and we talked. She positioned herself in front of my microphone, which she treats respectfully, as if people are waiting to hear us on the radio, and she and I are just here deciding what we'll tell them. It tickles me to see how seriously she takes it. Soon she tells me that she has outlived all her family members, including her younger brother, Louis, who was her protector, she says, even when they were young. He would chaperone her dates and tell her which of her boyfriends he liked and which ones he didn't. When I lost him, which was sorrowful, she says, I was left alone. 
and now there's no one left but me, which isn't the happiest thing for anybody, but there's nothing we can do about that. It's life. Anna has outlived her husband, Frederick, as well. They met when he was just out of the service in World War I. I went with him for a couple of years, and I had the one son, Frederick, who lives in California now. I call him my baby, she says. He's 75 years old. <laughs> she tells me the broad outlines of her life, and I keep asking her to go back and fill in the details and tell me stories. When you were growing up, what did you do after school, I said. We were outdoor kids. We walked a lot. We used to play hide and seek and things like that. There was no TV to keep us in the house. We took long rides on our bike. On our bikes. We all loved our bicycles. She could be describing my own childhood in Indiana in the 50s. We lived in the country too, and we were always on our bikes. Anna tells me about the Great Depression, how she and Frederick nearly lost everything, how she learned to be frugal and survived on very little. She's not sad or even wistful. It was hard, but she survived. We've been talking for less than two hours, and she says, well, that just about covers everything. <laughs> it occurred to me that Anna didn't care to talk about the past. She's living in the present and making plans for the future. But there's a lot that I need to know. How old was your husband, Frederick, when he died? He was 78. Wait, is that right? She calculates in her head. Yeah, 78. I was 72. But well, what was it like to be alone suddenly? It was terrible. For the first time today, Anna's voice is low and quiet. It was like my right hand was torn off of me, she says. I knew I had to calm down. I was ready to sell the house and move. I didn't know where, but I was, I didn't know where I was going to move. But thank goodness I calmed down and stayed. And I'm glad I did. This is my home, and I like it. Where were you thinking about going? I didn't know. I thought I had to get out and away. I was too confused, too upset. But as I say, I calmed down, so I did, didn't have to make a decision. And you've been alone for 30 years now. Yeah, that's a long time. But I had to go on. I had to take care of myself. I knew I had to be healthy and not get sick because there was nobody to care for me. And it just made me, thank goodness. Did you think about the future? No. I was so taken with this death that there was no future. Nothing left. Until I calmed down and then I just went from day to day. And then it became a way of living. And I accepted it. And there was nothing left to me, for me to do. She laughs. A few years later, a few men folk thought they had an eye for me, but I said <laughs> nothing new. <laughs> a lot of people imagine that when they're your age, they'll be lonely, I said. I have a lot of people ask me if I get lonesome. Well, I won't allow myself to get lonesome. I get out and I do something about it. I take a walk. I will not allow myself to get lonesome. She proclaims this directly into the microphone, and then she turns to me and says in a lower voice, it's true. <laughs> Anna, do you think about your age? In your mind, are you older? No, nope, it doesn't bother me. I just hope I never have to go to a nursing home. I hope I never do. I hope when the time comes, I go peacefully, no long illness. Just have it over with. It seems like you have a lot of folks around you, Anna. You're not alone. <coughs> That's true. You know, I'm a reader. I like to read in the afternoon. Sometimes when I get interrupted, I'm a little cross, but I forgive them. I did have one neighbor. Every little while, she was checking up on me. She was so afraid. So in a decent way, I told her not to fret, that if I did feel I needed her, I'd call. I kind of st it kind of stopped her from looking in on me. She meant well. She turns to me again and says in that lower voice, it's true, she was driving me crazy. <laughs> One more question. I gotta go. Anna, what do we have to look forward to being 100 years old? Well, the only thing I can say is don't sit. Get going. Move. Have an incentive. Don't keep thinking I'm old. Get it out of your system. Keep going. I don't stay put. That's it. Come on, she says. Let's go outside. She puts on her winter coat and I follow her down the steps and across the driveway to the mailbox. She retrieves, retrieves a few Christmas cards. Come over here, I want to show you something. She grabs a stick, an old shovel handle, and takes off toward the lake, walking carefully on dry pine needles. Watch the tree roots, she says. See, there's my boat. She points the stick 
at a wooden flat bottom rowboat upside down by the shore. That's where I go, down there. Look at how nice and calm the water is. If I'd known it was going to be like this, I would have left the boat in. She continues around the back and sits down on some steps that come out from the porch. See? I come out here just like this and I sit in the sun. Isn't this nice? We're looking out across the lake toward the west. The tree branches hang low over the water here on the point, and the late afternoon <coughs> sun pours melted gold on Anne's world. Her red hair is brilliant, and a light comes out of her. And when we get out here, she says, there's no interference, nobody around. You can come out here and you can skinny it. What? <laughs> I do, but only if it's foggy and there's no fishermen around. <laughs> she reaches over and puts her hand on top of my microphone. She doesn't want our listeners to hear her skinny dipping story, which includes the use of the word hinder. <laughs> Finally, she takes her hand off the microphone and continues, Oh, I could write a book. <laughs> I take Anna's picture and she takes mine. Later, I send copies to her son, Freddie, her baby in California. And in return, he sends me a one-pound package full of family photographs and newspaper clippings. There's Anna as a young girl with a long ponytail, <coughs> as a teenager with her basketball team, as a newlywed looking mischievous with Frederick, photos from all of her life up to the present time. And in picture after picture, there's the lake, too. Here she is, rolling down her stockings, getting ready to swim. And here with a girlfriend, their knees drawn up to their chest, sitting on a dock in long wool bathing suits. And here she is with Frederick, in middle age, dressed up for a fancy occasion, both of them wearing white shoes, laughing and sitting together on the bumper of a black sedan, the lake visible through the trees behind them. Anna chose to live here, on this lake, when her husband died, even though Freddie begged her to come and live with him in California. She knew herself well enough to know what would sustain her and what would give her life meaning. I don't feel like I have to ask her the meaning of life. I don't want to die, she says. I want to stay here. And you know, I'm going to stay here. I want them to throw my ashes in the pond, so I'm warning all the neighbors don't eat the fish. They might be eating me. <laughs> we both laugh. I tell you, she says, I'm something, aren't I? <laughs> um, Anna Wilmot is 108 and a half years old now. And um, invited me to her 109th birthday this summer, which I fully intend to go to. She uh, did leave her house and went to live with her baby, Freddie, in California just last fall uh, at age 107, and, uh, 108. And um, when they got to California, they promptly got on an airplane and went to the Philippines to visit his wife's family. And she's been there all winter, so I'm, I haven't heard from her, but uh, I'm, I'm eager to hear how it went in the Philippines. Um, there was a married couple that I met, who were both 100 years old when I met them. And uh, they had been married 80 years, which blew my mind. And uh, I had to go and find out what it was like to be married 80 years. They'd known each other since they were 19 years old. And uh, they'd both been dairy farmers in Vermont. And he courted her in he would take a, a sleigh in the wintertime to go take her to dances. And they <coughs> were dairy farmers until the 50s when they decided to start spending winters in Florida and then gradually made Florida their full-time home. Uh, their names were Sadie and Gilbert Hill. Sadie and Gilbert are sitting side by side matching Lazy Boy recliners as we talk, relaxed and attentive, amused, I think, at my questions. Gilbert is slender and wiry, and Sadie is petite and puckish. His hair is slicked down carefully, and hers is short and brushy. They both have thin lips. They press together when they smile, and both have flexible watch bands pushed halfway up their left forearms. 
Now and then, Gilbert reaches out and takes Sandy's hand and holds. I ask them about their daily routine, and Gilbert pipes up enthusiastically. We have to get up at 6 o'clock. Sadie can't sleep after 6 o'clock, after 5 usually. And by 6, she's raring to get out and get going. If we went all day the way she does in the morning, I don't know where we would end up. Sadie acknowledges this with the very slightest nod. She gets out of bed. I timed her this morning, just for fun. I got up first. But while I was in the bathroom, she gets up, she comes out here first and puts the coffee on. Got back and washed up and got dressed, and just 12 minutes after she got out of bed, just 12 minutes this morning, I had her right on the wall. Sadie chuckles. I don't have any secrets anymore, she says. Gilbert goes on. I timed her. It isn't far from the stove to the breakfast nook, right to the end of the counter. So then you have breakfast together, I ask. Oh, yes. And then read the paper. After the dishes are washed, we sit down and read the paper for a couple of hours. And what time do you have supper, I say. We have supper at 6 o'clock, dinner at 12, supper at 6, a little something before we go to bed at 11. We used to have coffee then, but the doctor told me it wasn't working good. So what do you have now before you go to bed? Orange juice and a cookie. And she has a special drink that the doctor's here for. Give her. <coughs> Ensure, Sadie says. Do you sleep together? Oh, yes, says Gilbert. Do you snore? I say to Gilbert. Not much. She sleeps on her left side ever since I married her, so she don't snore. I can't bring myself to ask them about sex. They seem modest, especially Sadie, and it's not as if I'm in the habit of talking to people about their sex lives anyway. And in retrospect, I'm not sorry I didn't ask. I think they would have thought it was rude and beyond the bounds of our business here. The questions I do ask fall into two categories. What their lives were like in the 20s and 30s and what their days are like now. Back then, it was all work. Now, they socialize. Sadie says, we have get-togethers and bean suppers. We belong to the Grange, and we go to that twice a month. We belong to the tourist club, too, and that's where we go to dances. And then there's the shuffling. Shuffleboard? Oh, yeah, they got a big covered shuffleboard court, so they can play the anytime. Anyway. And we belong to the Methodist Church, too. What kind of dancing do you prefer? And Gilbert answers, we do the waltz and the two-step now. <coughs> We used to do the square dances, but they got a man in that played the organ, and he had a speaker around in front of him, and he called the changes right along with the organ, but we couldn't hear. We got, we got used to using these things, and he taps his hearing aid, and they don't work too good, so we quit the squares. If I take mine out, Gilbert says, I can't hear a thing, not a thing. We have a pleasant few hours together. Gilbert gets up only once to show me a photograph of Sadie when she was young. They're amiable and lighthearted, but they ventured very little that I, that I did not ask about directly. When I told them the interview would be on nationwide radio, I was surprised when Sadie asked me to call her son and daughter to let them know and hear it because the children's names had not come up in our conversation. Before I left, we went outside and they let me take some photographs of them among their roses. And in the hot sun, we said our goodbye. <coughs> they asked me not to mention on the radio what town they lived in because they were starting to get a lot of calls from reporters, and I agreed. We stood on the sidewalk making small talk, and I realized that I was feeling a tug toward them. I didn't want to say goodbye because I knew I'd never seen them again. When I got home and tried to write about them, the radio series, Sadie and Gilbert Hill, were essentially a mystery to me. They had offered no insight about their longevity, and they didn't have anything particularly revealing to say about their long marriage, either. I listened to the interview over and over, looking for clues, and I kept coming back to the part where Gilbert described their morning routine. We have to get up at 6 o'clock. Sadie can't sleep after 6 o'clock. He was so emphatic. It was the most emotion he showed that day. I called their son in Vermont, and I heard Gilbert's voice 25 years younger. Kenneth Hill is retired from the postal service now, and many of his childhood memories are about hard labor. He says that Gilbert was a bull for work and tight as the bark on a maple tree. <laughs> Myself, I'm lazy, he says. I like to play golf now and then. He says Sadie and Gilbert don't know how phenomenal their long marriage is. They just always work well together, he says. 
but the first one that dies, they can't survive without each other. And did I know, he says, that last year Sadie had cancer? There had been no mention of that either. I listened to the tape again, and now I hear Gilbert's fear of losing Sadie, but the fact that she can get their breakfast on the table in just 12 minutes is a sign to him that everything's all right today. I go back to the photographs I took of them among their roses. Gilbert's standing straight, his stomach is flat, he has broad shoulders, a high forehead, and a long, thin nose. He looks directly at the camera. Sadie is a head shorter and hunched over, but also trim. Her eyebrows are raised in that bemused way. They stand side by side, and in the shadow between them, you can see that Gilbert is grasping her arm to steady her, to keep her close. He knows he can't last long without her. After I visited with Sadie and Gilbert, a mild panic began to grow inside me about losing my husband. My marriage is so short compared to theirs. How lucky they are, I thought, to have had so much time together. And what could I possibly do to make the years we have left together mean more? Each morning that spring, I awoke at dawn and lay in bed with the window open, listening for the first mockingbird, hearing the metro trains coming from Silver Spring. My husband Noah was warm and silent beside me. And as I pressed my ear flat against the mattress, I could hear his heartbeat echoing. Be here now, I thought. Just be here now. Um, Gilbert outlived Sadie by quite a few years. I didn't expect, nobody expected that he would last very long, but uh, he's still alive as far as I know. Um, she died a few weeks after their 81st wedding anniversary. And I heard from his son that within a few months after she died, he grew a mustache and bought a new suit. <laughs> and that in the afternoons, he was spending a lot of time with, a, with an elderly neighbor who was blind, and, but who needed to get some exercise. And so Gilbert would ride, uh, he had a little uh, three-wheeler, and he would drive it around uh, the neighborhood and with a rope attached to it so that his neighbor could get some exercise. And in the tune of a 104-year-old man riding the front door, anyway, these people were just endlessly interesting to me. And um, I feel so lucky to have stumbled into this whole world. Um, I'm, I am, however, going to play you a little bit of one story that I did uh, about the one-room schools because they were uh, also sort of a, a very surprising story developed for me. I have not talked about it in public very much, so I hope you'll indulge me. Um, I traveled all around the U.S and found out that there are three, roughly 300 one-room schools left. Many states don't uh, keep track of how many one-room schools they have. These are active public schools. I didn't even count the Amish schools, which uh, is a whole other very interesting story, as all of you know here in Iowa. But I just <coughs> public one-room schools. Um, the, uh, what got me interested was that I saw a documentary film uh, set in France about a one-room school, and I found the relationship between the teacher and the students mind-blowing. He had had these kids from kindergarten to the equivalent of seventh grade. He knew their families. He lived in the community. And it was a truly inspiring classroom scene to me. So I said, gee, you know, this must go on in this country. So, I had to call every state, one by one, and ask the Department of Education if they had one year schools. Some of them didn't even know. Um, make another long story short, um, the state that has the most is Montana. Um, and they have such a <coughs> huge geographical area and so many 
rural communities, and they are very actively trying to keep their one-room schools open, which is not the case in a lot of states. Um, you also probably know about Nebraska, which has recently passed legislation to force what they call the class one school, class one schools to become part of a larger district, which in effect eliminates a lot of the one-room schools. Um, Nebraska had more one-room schools than any other state for a long, long time, and they're disappearing very quickly in Nebraska. Um, the, the rough figures are that in, um, in about 1920, there were something like 150,000 one-room schools in the United States. In 1980, there were only 1,000 left. And today, my best guess is that there are around 300. And I'm hearing all the time about schools that are closing. And in fact, some of the schools that I went to just last spring had already closed. So many of them will never close because of the geographical situation they're in, island schools and things like that. But, um, the economics of it, um, many people argue, um, they just can't sustain it. So I would love to play you a very brief story that I did about a school in western Nebraska in Sioux County. Um, I met this teacher at a national rural education conference that I went to just to sort of see if I was going to be on the right track. If this really was an issue. These stories really needed to be told. And I met this woman and I just was blown away. And I described her as a combination as part nun and part Eleanor Roosevelt and part cowboy. Uh, she grew up on a ranch and went to one of those schools. Her parents were ranchers, they went to one of those schools. She is so dedicated to the institution of one of those schools. She was teaching at a school, a, a little school in a community that is almost extinct called Glen. Um, and when I was there, there were eight people that lived in Glen and only one school age boy left in the district. In 1920, 300 families lived within walking distance of that school. So that's, you know, they're losing population. Very but anyway, this is my story from the land. Mm -hmm. In Sioux County, Nebraska, three boys in sixth, seventh, and eighth grades and their teacher took me bushwhacking through a woody canyon. It was recess time. They wanted me to see a fort they built. It was the spring of 2005. See, you know, to our fort we have to pass a fence, go down the hill, go up the hill. Go down the hill. Yeah. Travis, Lee, and Nick were all born and raised in this country, and their teacher was too. Travis, if I fall in the hole, break my leg. Watch out, there's one right there. Was the construction of the fort after the boys read a book by Gary Paulson called Hatchet about a city boy who was in a plane crash in the wilderness. We have We have talked a lot about survival and survival. So we made a fort here where we could go. It's a little dome shaped house made out of sticks and pines. Travis Johnson is 13. He was born just up the hill from here. That's what I'm trying to imitate. Travis and the other two boys are the only students at the Glen School this year. This part of Nebraska, close to South Dakota and Wyoming, is losing population. So unless someone with children moves into the <coughs> school district soon, Glen School will close. But for now, because there are so few students, the teacher has a lot of flexibility. She takes them on field trips and lets them pursue the things they're interested in. Oh, they're killed here. Because it sounds like they say killed here, killed here. The result, she says, is confident kids who know themselves and the place they come from. That will help when, in a few years, they'll have to choose whether to stay in Nebraska or leave to find work. My job is to prepare them for those tough decisions. My, my own children had to leave. You know, they couldn't get a job here that did what they wanted to do. It is a tough decision, but I want them to be able to be prepared to leave here. You know, motherhood is your biggest, your goal on being a good mother is so that you raise a child and you put everything in them that you can 
so that they'll leave you and they don't need you anymore. And that's exactly how I feel about teaching. I really, really, really try hard to make sure that my kids can go anywhere and succeed at anything that they want to do or try. Travis Johnson is eager to go to high school. He wants to play football, and he'll be happy to have some girls as classmates, too. But he does say he feels lucky to have gone to this school, and he seems to understand what Mrs. Hurt has done for him and all the other students who went here. I don't really know anything that we haven't done with Mrs. Hurt. We've done just about everything. She's gotten us prepared for the real world. The real world being what? Away from Nebraska. Do you see the, the rest of the world as an inviting place, as an exciting place, as a kind of scary <coughs> thing? Or do you even think about it? Yeah. I think it's kind of exciting and inviting because I've done mostly everything where I'm from and I think I need to move on. I've watched students all my life, from the time I was a student in the one-room school, excel. I've seen them go out into life and be very productive adults. Not all of them, you understand, but many, many of them. And I think down the road, there's a lesson in that. Somewhere, somebody's going to have to understand. And we can't just talk about having smaller classrooms. We can't just talk about it. I think eventually education is going to have to stop and look at the example set by a one-room school and say, oh, my, maybe they weren't deprived. Maybe if they didn't get to play sports every day in a gymnasium, maybe that didn't affect their lives a whole lot. Maybe going to school and listening to the next kid's class and the next kid's class and happen to help that kindergartner when you're an eighth grader because the teacher was busy, maybe there's something to that. Many, many things have been done correctly in one-room schools. And the results are there to read in history if you just turn the right page. Moni Hurt was the last teacher at the one-room school in Glen, Nebraska. At one time, a hundred families lived within walking distance of the school. Now there are no elementary school-age children left in the district. In June 2006, after 120 years of service, the Glen School was closed. When pioneers filled the countryside of Nebraska, one-room schools were everywhere, and the state has kept them open longer than most. In the 1950s, there were nearly 3,000 of them, but today they're closing fast, and only about 50 remain. something going on there. 
definitely. Um, but it, there are many sort of other factors. And I think there's a definitely a personality type. Um, what these people had in common was very uh, optimistic, very good sense of humor, um, a passion for something other than themselves. They were extremely resilient and um, social. They weren't you know, couch potatoes. They weren't. Um, the men had a harder time as they got older because often it was the wives who were the outgoing ones and got to, you know, to push themselves all in the world. But uh, whether or not it's the personality that leads to this longer life or if you're just naturally more optimistic and uh, have a sense of humor because you're 101 and feeling good, <laughs> I don't know. But it's everybody that I talk to who are the experts seem to think that this attitude and this optimistic view of the world is extremely helpful. There's many different can you talk a little bit about the costs of good journalism, the need to support public broadcasting? And in, in my mind is, on this one room school story we did, what, what did that cost to produce? What was the budget? I can tell you, the, the, I, I received a grant to do this project from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which paid all of the expenses and my salary for about three years. A total budget was $120,000. And I guarantee you, I've done, I've worked on television projects, and you couldn't buy insurance for a TV shoot for $120,000. So it's extremely cost effective. I mean, nobody's making a huge amount of money, but um, uh, one of the other projects that I'm working on is this Holocaust uh, oral history project. And when I went there 10 years ago, they were doing all of their interviews on videotape, and I said, you know, this is crazy. It cost them, it was costing them upwards of a thousand dollars to do every oral history interview because they had to rent a studio and all. And I said, you know, hire independent radio producers and train them how to do these interviews. And since then, you know, the number of interviews that we've been able to do in the last, you know, ten years, just like, I don't know, quadruple, probably. So radio as an effective medium is extremely I mean, I call that cost of life. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to hear people go on the radio and beg for money and think, oh, there they are again asking for money, but I think the money goes a long way in public radio. Um, and, you know, we have, we, I mean, NPR has people in more foreign bureaus than most television networks do now. They all pull back, and NPR has people in, you know, everywhere because it's more <coughs> cost effective. And from, you know, I think creatively, and, it's a, a, a tremendously powerful medium. You know, um, there's a great push now to put audio on the internet and to put pictures with it, and I'm guilty of all those things, but I still think that radio by itself is the most intimate um, you know, purveyor of the human condition, <coughs> if not the news. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about that, but, but you know. Yes, you got Well, the more versatile you are, the more marketable you are. I mean, um, we none of us can predict where <coughs> things are going now. I mean, uh, in terms of where the jobs are going to be. Um, but I guarantee you there are always going to be jobs for good writers. And the more variety, the more versatility you have as a writer, the more different kinds of things you can learn to uh, approach and express, the better off you are. I mean, 
write criticism, write weather reports. I did, you know, farm market reports. I didn't always know what they meant, um, but I did them. I wrote, you know, I rewrote on my wire card. Um, and I really think that it was a huge part of why I was able to sort of move so quickly because I had a lot of writing experience. So I guarantee you that it was not my radio voice that got me a job at NPR. It was you know, the fact that I had a lot of writing, a lot of writing, because a lot of people are afraid to write. I still meet a lot of people who proclaim to have a career in as radio producers who do what I do, and they never write anything. They just cut together audio, which is a creative act, but it's not really, you know, writing. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, if you can learn to write, you are going to be, you're going to have tremendous advantages over other people in journalism, in life, in everything. You know. Yes. When you were writing your book. Uh, Meet people who uh, work longer than 64, 74, oh, the 84. Question, to the question, did I mean people and who worked past? Their health at the end of work. People who didn't want to stop working. I mean, I mentioned I've met a law professor who was 100 years old and still teaching. I went to his, uh, I sat, I spent a day with him. He was not at all interested in being interviewed that day. But he tutored first year law students from 9 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon. And he was the most alive person that, you know, he, he thrived on it. He lived for it. You know. There were a lot of people, uh, if they weren't working, they were actively doing something that they really loved. You know, that was a common denominator, you know, volunteering. Or um, I met a lady who got married, remarried at 98, who was um, functionally blind, who was performing in community theater events after age of hunger. Yeah. So it, it was very inspiring <coughs> to see people working, you know. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The educational level uh, was all over the map. I mean, I met people who hadn't finished eighth grade. And they're, that, you know, they say that longevity is sometimes tied to educational level because you have access to health care. But um, it was not my experience, these people. And, and also, diet didn't seem to be a factor. A lot of people ask me that. Um, I, I rarely asked people what was their secret because they always had a snappy <coughs> answer that was totally made up because they didn't know about it. I mean, one person said, you know, well, uh, what got me on 100 was I have Coca-Cola and a moon pie. <laughs> Stuff like that. I mean, it's just totally, they don't know. So, yeah. Um, I think that the, the, the longevity gene protects them from a lot of the things that cancer and heart disease and stroke that most of us aren't protected from. Yes. To follow up on the comment about the, the students and whether they should write and write, uh, I hope the students have taken note of, the, of how many times you referred to research you did. You didn't just go out with a microphone and say it in people's face. No. You went to a lot of hard work. That's not reporting, that's fishing. <laughs> that's what we call fishing. And I, you know, um, I do a tremendous amount of reading before I go and see somebody. And in the case of these people, you know, they're, I mean, the centenarians, I would call their families and call people that knew them and do, I mean, a lot of them had been written about in their community newspaper. So I would do those searches and find out about the history of the town or, you know, the basic economic factors in that part of the country, or if they were veterans, I would find out where they served, and you know, try and just prepare myself as best I could, so I at least had some line of questioning. Oftentimes, my research went completely out the window, because I found out something about them that was <coughs> way more interesting than what I expected. But at least I got there with a plan. You know, I wasn't just, so tell me, you know, 
where were you going? I knew where they were going. I just want to applaud you as a storyteller because you are a storyteller. And and but the other thing is is that you allow these folks you're interviewing to to tell their stories, and and that is a skill in itself. And to me, the most important part of that whole scenario is to be a good listener. And not I too many folks who are out there working are thinking about their next question or they're you know and they're not really listening. You are a listener too, so oh, I applaud you for that. Thank you. I, I wrote about that in the book because it was a huge learning curve for me in this project and learning how to listen. Because I, as I mentioned, I went into these first interviews like with three pages of questions. And by about the fifth interview, I could, like I gave that up because they weren't going along with my program. And I really did have to learn to just be quiet and let it unfold. And the other thing I did in this project, which I had never done before, I was never able to do when I worked for NPR, was to go back the second day or the third day. And that's when it really started to happen. You know, because then, on the second day, I could tell if they were telling if they were telling me everything that they told me before. That was interesting. Or if every story was completely new, that was interesting. Uh, or if this, you know, if everything was consistent. Um, and also by the second day, they got to say, they trusted me more. So people were telling me things. And then they remembered more, too. It takes oh, us a yeah. while sometimes Absolutely. to remember. Absolutely. And, and then they would start telling me things that, you know, I was like, <laughs> sure you tell me that. So it, going back um, became really important part of this, too. And um, thank you for that. Lesson, a lesson. <coughs> I'm intrigued by you know, having interviewed people who were 100 years or older and Holocaust victims. What, what are the discernible differences or when, when you approach those? I mean, those, those are different types of yeah. interviewing projects. Yeah. The Holocaust survivor interviews are really hard. Um, and, and, and there's a connection between the two, obviously, you have to be really patient because a lot of these people don't really want it. They want, they want their story on the record. They don't want to tell it because it's so painful to relive for them. You know, many of them experienced unspeakable things or saw horrible things happen to their family or did terrible things to other people that they don't care about in order to survive. And so reliving those, um, that part of their lives is very difficult. And as the interviewer, you experience that. Because these interviews, much like the centenarian interviews, are very long, you know, hours. And, and so, you know, when somebody's in emotional distress and you're there trying to draw, pull it out of them, you feel that. Too. So, I mean, after they're over, I just like, have to go home and go to bed and not talk for a couple of days because they're really stressful. However, um, I feel compelled to do it because, in, you know, in 10 years there won't be any Holocaust survivors left. And um, I feel like it's something I can do, but not a lot of people can do it. Um, and the people that I work with at the museum are so dedicated grateful and the families are so grateful too. Um, I interviewed I have a lot of great stories about that, but I interviewed a woman who had, you know, a terrible story and she had never uh, she had one photograph of her family. And because I was able I interviewed her at length and um, because I was at I'm at the museum all the time and it's really a research institute, the Holocaust Museum if you haven't been there, it's really it's a it's a academic research institute as well. They have wonderful archives. And I was able to go to the archives and spend a couple of days there and find a photograph of her father. And she, I mean, just, she was so, you can't imagine. You know, she hadn't seen him since she was eight years old and she had one picture of her whole life. So it's a, it's, you know, when you have those skills, and for me, you know, it's just, I can do that. 
So it's hard not to when you know that they're not going to be around you know, 10 more years. You know. And even now, it's getting hard to do the interviews because the ones that are, uh, they're either so old that their memories are really shaky, or they were children at the time of the Holocaust, and their memories are sort of unreliable because a lot of them are remembering things they've been told or things they've read. And, they're, and, and because it's a research institution, they're really determined that they'll have the, uh, you know, as reliable or as free interview collection as they can. So there's a lot of people that they just won't interview. Unlike, for example, not to, not to diss it, but the Steven Spielberg collection that they did um, they're just interviewing everybody they can get. So I don't really believe it's going to be as useful a research collection as the Holocaust Museum will be in you know, 20 years from now. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Can you reflect back? Three years ago, we said a professor or a speaker at Drake said, run resumes and go out. And can you reflect on, did you see yourself doing Today and 30 years ago, and what would you say to a senior college <coughs> faced with those choices? Yes, this is what I wanted to do, basically. I didn't know how I was going to get here, but I, I was, you know, like focused as a kid. I knew I wanted to be in journalism from the time I was 12. And, you know, not everybody is that way, and I know that. But, <coughs> For me, it was um, sort, of, sort of being given permission to do it by people who'd already done it and who said, yeah, you can do that, you know, go ahead. So it was a matter of articulating the vision. I knew I wanted to travel and I knew I wanted to be a reporter. I didn't know about public radio. I didn't know I would end up in Washington. I, you know, I didn't know that I sort of thought I might become a magazine writer or a newspaper writer. Um, so it was just a matter of when a door opened, walking through it, and you know, just kind of trusting and kind of keeping in mind the big picture. Is this going to get me closer to what I want to do? And if not, if it's totally horrible, will at least give me some skills that I know I need to get there. Because I did some things that, you know, not so hard. It's, it's a kind of an idealistic answer because I knew early that I wanted to do it. Yes, in fact, I was just curious. As a consequence of all of your experiences, did you, uh, did it in any way modify your own behavior or uh, any attitude? Are you more optimistic or, uh, about growing older yourself? I think I'm more realistic. <laughs> I'm fascinated, uh, as, as you, you were too, about how the elderly lived in the present and preferred not to go back because they were, and I'll, I'll say this for you to correct, because they were more curious and involved in the present than they were preoccupied with what happened in the past. Many of them, that's true. Is, is that true? Not all of them, but many of them. I'd say the ones who were doing the best, that, they all had that in common. Yeah. They liked to talk about it. I mean, it wasn't that they were, you know, they remembered the past, but it was just like, that was that. But they were so engaged in the they present. They were totally engaged. They were busy. You know, they weren't sitting around reminiscing. You know, 
ago, they weren't looking for their photo albums. And, you know, they were on the internet and <laughs> going square dancing. And, um, I don't want to make it, you know, I don't want to go overboard and paint an extremely rosy picture because the truth is that most people in their old, you know, that age are not as active. I'm saying a third of the people who reach that age, a third of the centenarians that statistically have never had a major illness. So there's two thirds that are, you know, struggling from day to day. But for me, the good news was the one third. But they are there. And I didn't even know that. And I meet many people who, who say to me, I would never know. Why would you want to live to be 100? You know, what's, what could be good about it? And I have to say, I didn't know, I didn't know people who were leading lives that I wanted to have in 100 years old. You know, until I met Anne. And I said, wow, she's like, you know, that's how I want to be. You know. You know, yeah. I mean, who had role models at 100 years? I mean, I. You know, I met, I mean, with one of the hundred year old people, I went with her to a college. She was 101. And no, none of the kids had ever met anybody, they said, outside of their family who was over 65. And they looked at her like she was from another planet. <laughs> they were just in, they couldn't speak. And I think that with our society, families divided, a lot of young people don't know or they don't have daily interactions with them. I mean, the hundred-year-old people, they're not visible to most of us. We don't <coughs> see them in the restaurants. You don't see them in the movie theaters. They're kind of this hidden population. Um, so, you know, they're there. They're incredible. But there are, there is the other two girls. Yes? You say there's approximately 50,000. What will it be 10 years from now? Well, I've heard that in 2020 it'll be a million if it continues at this rate. I mean, so, isn't so it? People won't be lonely, will they? <laughs> 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 I hope not. That's too bad a shot at us. <laughs> you know, people, there's now the demographers are tracking a whole group of people they call super centenarians who are 110, which is what Verona Johnston. She was called, there's a whole category for people who are 110 now. And that is growing. I mean, statistically, the oldest they, they people. They have free health insurance and they get to pay 110. Yeah. A lot of them said, Don't you think we should be relieved from paying taxes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yes. What's, uh, what should we look for in the future from you? What are you, what, what are you looking at that you'd like to uh, write about? Well, uh, I'm working on a story now about a fisherman in Maine who's um, trying to understand what happened to all the codfish in the Gulf of Maine. Um, it's a part of an environment of a conservation series that's going to be on public radio this fall. Five hour series. I'm doing one part of five hours. And honestly, um, after, I'm going to do some real intensive work on the Holocaust project. Um, this summer, because we're really starting to get you know, this lot of people, losing a lot of people. Um, and I've kind of been a little not sure after that. Um, I'm getting very interested in, uh, uh, there was an article on the front page of the New York Times Magazine last week about uh, women returning from combat, veterans returning mm -hmm. from Iraq. And, uh, and I, you know, my background is interviewing Holocaust survivors and hundred-year-old people and going to small towns. I think this would be a good kind of subject for me because I seem to have this ability to create a relationship with people over time, which you would need to do, I think, in order to uh, talk with those women. And I think, you know, a year from now, maybe those stories will be really be important because there'll be so many of them coming back and there's so many you know, services for them coming back, many of them with post-traumatic stress disorder and also having a big rate. So there's a real terrible social um, story to be told there, but I'm still feeling I'm going to move in that direction. Um, thank you all.